Enjoying the sun like this on Monday or Tuesday during the hottest part of the day just won't be possible as more stark warnings about the heat continue to come. With temperatures forecast to reach 40 degrees Celsius somewhere in the UK and records very likely to be broken, just how exceptional is this? So it's the first time the Met Office have issued a red warning for extreme heat. And that just shows how extreme the temperatures are expected during Monday, Tuesday, not only by day, but by night. Some people are saying, look, 1976, there was a heat wave. What's so different about this? Is this being over-egged, essentially? Well, 1976 was an extraordinary summer. It was exceptionally dry. It remains the sunniest summer on record. But the hottest day in 1976 reached a peak of 35.9 Celsius, which means that if we get to 40 Celsius on Tuesday, that would be four degrees higher than any day throughout the 70s and the 80s. So it's the extreme temperatures that we are most worried about. And it's these figures that have led to the second emergency COBRA meeting chaired by the Cabinet Office Minister Kit Malthouse on what the government are doing to respond. The first is obviously health and social care, uh, where there's been a lot of work, first of all, messaging those people who may be vulnerable. Second area is schools, uh, where obviously we want to make sure kids do continue to go to school. We think they are safer in schools, but that those schools should have more help and guidance and all the support they need. And then thirdly, transport, uh, where we do think there's going to be a significant impact. While the rail workers are busy painting tracks white to reflect the sun, Labour's deputy leader is turning up the heat on Boris Johnson, accusing him of partying while Britain boils. The Prime Minister's reportedly at Chequers this weekend. Among the warnings, seemingly the most severe, coming from the UK Health Security Agency, asking people to stay safe to reduce the number of excess deaths from this heat wave. Last summer, there were 1,600 with lower temperatures. GPs like Dr. Natalie Rout are on high alert. I hope that people take the necessary precautions because heat related illness is avoidable by making sure that you are hydrated, making sure that you're prepared for the day, know when to avoid the sun, know when to avoid the highest heat. So these things are avoidable. Um, and I just hope that people take notice of that. It's hard to take in the weather news right now, especially when there were lovely scenes like this across southern England. But weather experts say extreme heat is on the way and they're experiencing it in Europe right now. In southern Portugal, the temperature is 47 degrees Celsius. And over in southwest France, more than 12,000 people have had to leave their homes because of wildfires in the Gironde region. Helicopters and planes are battling flames in Malaga with the severe weather there lasting until Sunday and temperatures staying high. This NASA image recently released shows multiple heat waves around the world for this summer. Temperature records are breaking and fueling wildfires. A sign there, scientists say, is a clear pattern of climate change caused by human activity now starting to impact our living conditions. Well, earlier I spoke to Professor Emily Shukbra, who is director of Cambridge Zero, the University of Cambridge's major climate change initiative. I began by asking her about the seriousness of the heat we're seeing here and across Europe right now. This sort of heat is quite simply deadly. Um, when we've seen heat waves in the past in this country in 2020, there were more than 2,500 heat related deaths. It particularly affects the elderly, but also if you're pregnant, if you have a baby, then you'll realise quite how um, difficult it is to, to really survive in this kind of temperature. You stood alongside the Chief Scientific Advisor, Patrick Balance, at a, an emergency briefing for MPs this week when he said the world is to be plunged into even deeper turmoil than we've seen during the COVID pandemic. Now, of course, you have to convince all of us of that, but perhaps particularly the decision makers, the MPs. Now, there was some controversy for the fact that the leadership candidates didn't attend that briefing. How worried are you about that? Well, I am worried that the world over, policymakers are simply not taking the threat of climate change seriously enough. We are now seeing the impacts of climate change occurring in every single region of the world. Heat waves, as we're experiencing at the moment, 
flooding events, as we've seen repeatedly impact communities across the world, um, including in the UK. Devastating wildfires that we've also seen causing devastation to communities. This isn't a problem of the future, this is a problem of today. And we're not seeing the response required from countries in terms of emissions reductions. What should the government be doing right now that it isn't doing on those things? So the government should be focusing across every sector of the economy on how we reach net zero. And that means um, looking at new technologies, but it also means looking at what policies can be put in place to encourage behavioural change as well, because we need both. And the other side of things, which is really highlighted by the heat wave right now, is that we need to be looking at how we adapt as a country to the climate changes that we are already experiencing and will only get worse in years to come. Now, finally, or eventually, four out of the five leadership candidates have now committed to standing by the net zero targets that the government have set. Uh, one of the candidates, Kemi Badenoch, described the targets as unilateral economic disarmament. What do you make of that? Um... <laughs> Listen, climate change is a scientific fact. It is a scientific fact that to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, we have to reduce emissions globally as rapidly as possible. So this isn't about unilateral disarmament. This is about unilaterally avoiding disaster. Do you accept on any level, though, the argument that in the middle of what is a crippling cost of living crisis affecting millions of people, the environment can actually feel less of a priority? Well, it may feel less of a priority, but it's intimately connected with all these other challenges. We've seen a pandemic that's caused huge disruption globally, but pandemics and, and, and um, diseases that come from um, the animal world are increasing as a consequence of the destruction of habitats exacerbated by climate change. The energy crisis, which is the root cause of the cost of living crisis, is at its heart a fossil fuel driven energy crisis. If we moved away from our dependency on fossil fuels, embracing renewable energy instead, then we wouldn't be in this situation. So it's impossible to disentangle climate change from these other, uh, these other global crises. Professor Emily Shukbra, thank you so much for talking to us today. That's okay.